word for word and I've I've read it and I uh, I mixed I used to mix and match and so today I'm gonna do something different and uh, that could scare you I'm gonna just speak oh there you go there you go but I do have some notes but let's uh, um, let's just pray and then ask Holy Spirit to uh, uh, give us what he wants us to learn. So Father in heaven, we just thank you. Your word is active in a double-edged sword that uh, judges the motives and the intents of our heart. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you walk among us. Uh, the Holy Spirit, that you are here right now and uh, that you are our teacher, our comforter, and our convictor. And we praise you and thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. My message this morning is called uh, Family... Oh, look at that, I went. Hang on. There we go. Family business. How many have uh, ever been a part of a family? I hope all of you. Otherwise, you are an immaculate conception, and I don't think I've met most of you. I don't think that's the truth. Uh, you may be wonderful people, but uh, you are all born into a family. You know, a few years ago, uh, at the, when I was a manager in the funeral home, we brought, we sponsored a guy, uh, he was an ex-policeman that came up from the U.S. and his specialty was working with gangs. And what he was talking about is gangs feed on the brokenness of family and they become a family uh, to those that have been cast out. And of course you can find that in every every area of our lives that there's an attraction when we lose our family our family becomes broken that we search out different things to become family for us and of course out of that can come codependent relationships abusive relationships and all kinds of things and more hurts and building one layer on the top and so um, it says in this uh, article, it was called Divorce Rate in Canada. It says divorce is the ambiguous term in Canada. And half of all marriages end up in divorce. How's that like that for stats? According to a statistic, approximately 38% of marriages in Canada end in divorce. Basically, commitment is the main reason for staying together for most couples. So when we think of family, uh, I can't tell you how many people that break apart in family says we were in love with one another but we fell out of love and of course love is not simply an emotion and a feeling in a family love is actually a commitment to that family when the emotions aren't there it doesn't mean that you don't want emotions in there but when emotions start to fail because of the busyness and the hurts and things that we bring into those relationships all of a sudden what we end up doing is we end up uh, uh, bailing out and it takes our commitment to the family to stay there and of course we see that in the new the new testament we see god uh sent jesus and jesus called out a bunch of people and did they all get along no they didn't get along they argued about who was going to be the greatest they had one guy that was a, a crook <laughs> and betrayed Jesus, they had one that was uh, very uh, outspoken, and they had all kinds of other diverse families, and they fought constantly, and Jesus was always trying to bring correction. But family is what Jesus wanted to build, and God wanted to build, and so he built a new family called the church. Now, is church this theater building? No. Church isn't uh, a building, church is you. And the family of God is you. You individually. It says, and uh, we'll get further into Ephesians chapter 2, that it says that each one of you is a living stone being built together for a dwelling place for God's spirit. And so we've been reaching or looking at this area of family uh, out of Ephesians. And of course, I don't want to beat Ephesians 1's up. So we're going to finish that chapter today. And we're going to talk about this family business. Now, one of the things that's most important about family is your identity. Wouldn't you say so? What's your family traits? What were you like? What did you grow up with? Well, when you become part of God's family, 
Uh, there's only one identity that we need to remember, and that's the identity of Jesus Christ. How he walked, how he spoke, and how he interacted. And the whole point of God's family is to bring ourselves into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't leave us alone. He brings us the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about that. So Paul starts his, uh, his scriptures off. He starts, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are the faithful followers of who? The Pentecostals? The Victories? The Baptists? The Catholics and the Lutherans? No, Jesus Christ. And that's going to be a theme that chapter 1 hits is that it's all about Christ. Not about us and how we worship and our styles. The family is built on the head of the family, who is Jesus the Christ. Ah, there we go. It's like scary. <laughs> May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you what? Grace and peace. How many uh, could use a little more grace? And a little more peace? All of us. And so God gives you that. Through who? Jesus Christ and the Father. All praise to be God, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. How many love a blessing? Are you in Christ? Then you're blessed. Stop acting like you're not blessed. <laughs> But he has all praised the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every, say every, every. spiritual blessing in the where? The heavenly realms because we are united with who? Christ. Who's our family head? Exactly. Good job. Isn't this exciting? Hallelujah. There we go. I will use an illustration anyways. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Now, one of the things that can be a little bit separating our head of our sh off our shoulders is the foreknowledge of God. Do you know that it means that God knows your choices before you do? <laughs> He knows your thoughts. He knows the situation. And it's hard in our finite mind to understand that. But what I had this picture, I was, when I was reading a book, he says, God sees a picture, and we see the beginning of the picture. But he sees the end and the beginning and all the middle portions. And I remember a few years ago, I was watching a friend of mine's dad, who was a carver, uh, take this piece of rock, and I said, wow, that's an ugly rock. And I said, how do you, because he was an amazing carver. I said, how do, you, how do you do that? He says, I see the image in the stone, and then I chip away everything that's not a part of that image. And that's God. He sees you as, your, as his children, and he chips away the stuff that is not a part of his image. Now, I had a friend that was uh, born and he was given up by his parents and I met him in OK Falls and for he was 85 years old when I met him. I met him earlier but I really didn't know him until 85 and he went his whole life even as a believer and prior to believer before he became a believer as a raging alcoholic who was a violent man a violent man and it was amazing some of the stuff that he lived God had a problem and a purpose but when he came to Christ he found a new family, but one of the things that bothered him, even till the day he died, was the rejection of his biological parents. It really bugged him, and I said, well, your new identity is in Christ, but there was something that bothered him. If anyone's ever gone through, an, uh, been rejected by family or whatever, there's a, there's a crisis that begins to build in you. And God wants to restore that. Another friend of mine whose father walked out on him as a young age and they lived in poverty was the same way. Except he, instead of being violent, the other guy was violent and successful. This guy was just successful because he was driven by the rejection to never live in poverty. And so he was never at peace. I would say, man, I can hardly wait to get to heaven and see Jesus. He says, I hope I get there. If you're sitting here this morning or listening online, you say, I hope to get to heaven, you're missing 
the power that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. You may have a family that has rejected you and walked out on you, but you have a God who's calling you right now. And the church is the new family that is to be proclaimed that God wants a relationship with you. All of us know how bad we are. All of us know the things we're going through. But God is expecting and wanting a relationship with you and he's calling you out. And the verse says that he adopted us. He adopted us into his family. And he decided beforehand who was the family was going to be. Now a lot of people argue this debate of God's sovereignty and free will, but all have been called, few are chosen, and it says many have been called, but few are chosen, but God's voice went out into the world through Christ. It's up to you to receive it. But the great thing about adoption is when I had my children, I didn't have a choice. They didn't have a choice, hallelujah. How many you care? You know, I remember my dad saying, well, we can't put it back. <laughs> I thought that's funny. It's true. You have this kid and you look at it, this baby, and you go, wow, now what do I do? I got a baby. And, you, and they don't have a choice and you don't have a choice. I mean, you have a choice to reject the baby, but you don't have a choice. They're still your baby, right? And so all of us are God's creation. And he knew our hearts. He knew our rebellion. And yet he chose beforehand to adopt all who come to him through Christ Jesus. Do you realize that you are not a mistake? Either prior to Christ or before Christ. You are not a mistake. God has called you and he wants to adopt you. And if you're a child of God, you have been adopted. And you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places through Christ Jesus. And this was what he wanted. Back to our scripture. It was what he wanted and it gave him great pleasure. You know, in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, it says that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Okay? Again, the foreknowledge. But what comes to me on that, when we're looking at adoption, is God's nature is triune. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are triune. We're body, soul, and spirit. God in heaven was up there, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit interacting, and they saw what would happen to humanity, and they made a decision. The Father said, who will go? Jesus said, send me. I will go. And he came knowing that he would be rejected and hung on a cross so that we would have the opportunity to be adopted. God is not wanting to judge us in the sense of sending us to hell. We choose to go there because we reject that adoption. He will not walk out on us like our family may have in the physical. He will not criticize us and reject us. He will never leave us and forsake us if we receive the adoption. It's not conditional of your race, your culture, or your past. It's conditional on one thing. What are you going to do with Jesus? See, the greatest deception that I find that people walk in, both in and out of the church, is the deception that they're one, they're good enough, I'm not as bad as that person, or we are not good enough and that God could never redeem us. Those are deceptions of the enemy. Those are deceptions of Satan. Because we can never be good enough. Which is why Jesus came. If we could be good enough, then he would not have come. But we couldn't. We couldn't. We failed all the time. And those who think they're good enough, you may outwardly act good enough, but what about your thought life? Because God looks at that too. And those who are, think they're too evil, that's what the cross was about. That Jesus took his, uh, the justice or the wrath of his father, not by... Oh, God hung him on the cross and killed him, but he chose to go to that cross and receive the judgment that we deserved and release life to all who accept him. And of course, that's part of our inheritance. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him, in him is who? Christ. We have redemption. 
bought the, uh, we were bought with a price is what redemption means we were sold we were slaves being sold cheaply and God sent his son and paid our price you don't have to be good enough you can't be evil enough all you have to do is receive Jesus Christ that's it and you're adopted into the family you know adoption agencies charge lots of money for for people uh, for children it's a money maker to be adopted God paid your price all you have to do is accept that he did it and so in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace make sure I got all that did I miss that <laughs> hang on now I'm just got for translation okay according to the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with wisdom and understanding okay so how many of you don't feel forgiven when you mess up oh you do Wow you guys are real participatory I think you call that's a word my word but the point is is all of us when we fail we for we think that we are now condemned but we're not if we've accepted Christ Jesus we stand in a place of forgiveness we may have to repent and receive our conscience cleansed of all unrighteousness according first John 1 9 but we are forgiven if you are not in Christ you do not have the forgiveness of God the wrath according to John 3 or the condemnation still rests upon you if you read John chapter 3 the very end verse it says the condemnation those who reject the son condemnation is still upon them you're still destined to the wrath of God or the judgment of sin wrath's got a negative context but God doesn't want that and it's because of the lavishes of his rich grace he's provided redemption and adoption for those that want to receive Christ and he's done it with all and he lavished it on it means he poured it out uncon I mean it's overflowing with all wisdom and understanding the family is all about identity do you know who you are in Christ do you know you're redeemed and do you know you're forgiven people that know they're redeemed and forgiven will be forgiving other people and they won't judge other people and they won't criticize other people that's God's family and so God is now he's got we have to accept or we ha we are adopted then we're accepted and now it's about our attitude how many of you have great attitudes <laughs> I'm a wonderful attitude especially if you believe like me but the problem is is it's our attitude and that's why the Bible says that we have to be renewed in the attitude of our minds if we're going to be a part of God's family we must allow the Holy Spirit and the scriptures to begin to wash away our worldliness which is why Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 says because of God's great mercy uh, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your what so you know what you may know what God's good and perfect will if you want to know God's will you need to get in his word you need to begin to change that bad thinking of the world that is in there the residue and you need to replace it with what God says he you need your mind renewed and part of God's family is we all are one body despite at the way we worship and speak but the problem that I've seen in the Western culture is we're a Wednesday or a Sunday morning church a local denominational church and then we pick apart our brothers and sisters or we don't even associate with one another because you don't act like me and do like me God's not looking for you to be conformed into individual other people he's looking to be conformed to the patterns of Christ and be transformed which means there's no end to his transformation and every family has grandparents how many here are grandparents I am now hallelujah parents or you wouldn't have children young adults teenagers children toddlers and babies do you not know that every family uh, depending on your age has different expectations 
And when we lose that identity of expectation, we, uh, we begin to criticize one another. As grandparents or older believers, we are called to mentor younger believers. And as parents, you mentor younger or your, younger, your younger children. As young adults, you have to be able to receive mentorship or you'll never experience the kingdom of God. If you know it all or you're not able to have speaking the truth or correction in your life, you will never grow up. You'll just be an independent person floating from church to church or family to family, criticizing everybody and be offended because you did, they didn't do what you wanted them. And so, if you're a young adult or a child, you have to be able to be corrected. If you're a grandparent, you have to do it in love. And you have to also encourage and accept people in their flaws. With toddlers and babies or new believers, our job is basically to help them grow into young adults, to be parents and to be grandparents. God has one family one perfect one and one Lord Jesus. Our unity is not based on our, on our uh, conformity, it's based on our diversity under the headship of the only perfect one who is Jesus. Hence our, our slogan, no perfect people. In Christ you're perfect, but in the natural you're being made perfect. Ephesians 1, 9 says, uh, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. You see all the in hymns and in Christ? If you take you out of it, you realize that your spirituality and your identity is in Christ. And what do you think God the Father thought of Christ? Hated him? Loser? No. He says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So in Christ, God's saying to you, you are my beloved child, and I'm well pleased. And if you're walking in the Spirit, listen. It says those that listen to you that are walking in the Spirit, they'll listen to God. It doesn't make you God, but they'll listen to you. In verse 10, to put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. See, like a natural family, every member is on stages of growth. And our unity isn't on conformity. Our unity is accepting the failures and the age group and the things on every stage. Unity displays God's love and it has to be done in humility, correction, and forgiveness despite weaknesses or failure. See, disunity in a family is built on striving, comparisons, jealousy, immorality, and division. Mercy and forgiveness reveals we, uh, the lack of mercy and forgiveness reveals we don't believe that we are forgiven. See, if you're not a forgiving person or you're judging uh, someone, it could be a spouse, it could be a child, it could be another church member or whatever, you're showing that you don't understand forgiveness. That's what you're showing. Because forgiven people forgive. It doesn't mean you have to accept the attitude or the things they do. You have to release forgiveness, which is why the Bible says you must forgive. See, the world lives in an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth mindset. You cut my arm off, I'll cut your arm off. You blew up this person, I'll blow up your person. And that's how the world lives. But God's family is different. Can you say, I am different? I'm a child of God. My identity is in Christ, who died and rose from the dead for his enemies. Do you realize that? God laid down his life for his enemy that they may be adopted. Without forgiveness and loving correction, unity is impossible. See, one of the struggles that a church goes through as a, as a group of believers is we either overcorrect or we undercorrect. And so then we have people running around criticizing or being criticized and it creates disunity. We're going to talk more about that in Ephesians 4, but the point is, is for, without forgiveness, without understanding we've been forgiven, we won't forgive other people. 
And without being corrected, we won't grow, just like a child. If you don't correct your child, they're miserable. They're miserable to be around, and they're miserable with themselves, and they just, they'll destroy their own lives. And a parent and a grandparent are there to help correct and bring correction. And in the same way, we as one another, as one family, are to help each other grow in a spirit of love and mercy. Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand, whether it's a natural or spiritual uh, family. If you've been through a divorce, how many of you have been through a divorce? You can raise your hand, it's all right. <laughs> it's miserable. But the point is, is the reason it happened is because you were divided. I mean, getting away from all the abuses and different things that some relationships bring, if you are, un if you are divided within your family, you will not stand. And in a church, if we are not unified under the headship of Jesus Christ, living in forgiveness and mercy, we cannot stand against our enemy, the devil. It's only God's unity that brings power, and it has to be done under the power of Christ. See, a church's power, influence, and growth all centers on unity. And when we're in unity, we have authority. says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he made everything work out according to his plan. Whose plan did it work out according to? How many people want to go to church according to their plan? <laughs> and have the church work according to their plan? That's the fun part about pastoring, hallelujah. I have a plan for you. You have a plan for me. The problem is, is our plans never mesh usually, and if they do, there will be some interesting interactions. The plan is according to God's plan. His family is built on His plan, not our plan, which means we must surrender our wills to His will, which is the free will. You know, your authority comes from your identity. Whose child are you? You know, I hear lots of times people say, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I said, oh, is that right? So God's children are sinners. That's their identity. No, God's children do sin, because the Bible says that no man doesn't sin. But our identity isn't based on our thoughts and our sinful nature. It says, well, we won't go into that, but it is based on Christ, who we've been forgiven and redeemed. Our authority comes through Christ. It's our identity. You know, when we see people like Robin Williams that uh, took his life, Prince, How Prince Harry who struggles with depression, Abraham Lincoln, Jim Carrey, the actor, and maybe you are struggling with depression. Most of the time, not going away from, you know, chemical imbalances and natural things that do cause that you need help uh, through natural path and, and medical intervention sometimes to bring back your chemical balance. Most people struggle in their authority of life because they don't know who they are. They have no significance and no purpose. And they'll either be over arrogant or they'll be depressed. So how can we know who we are? Well, it starts with the Word of God. If you're not reading your Word and seeing what God says, if you're just listening to me tell you what God says about you, you're going to have a problem. Because it's going to be based on me and what I said, or a denomination, or a set of, of preferences, or doctrines, or whatever it is. The identity we have to know is what Christ and what God says about us. And he says you're his child. Those that believe on his name, he's given the power and the right to be children of God. See, God chose to adopt you. He wants a relationship with you. He's not choosing some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. He's calling all to know him. Some won't, and some will. And he knows that too. He's willing to accept you just as you are. He's willing to allow you to bring all your luggage in, and then he'll unpack it with you, so that you can feel accepted in his family. And by doing that, then he's going to change your attitude and how you view him, yourself, and others. And when we do that, we begin to walk in the authority that God planned. Not in uh, a rose garden, 
We will suffer. We will have persecutions. We're going to have trials. But we're going to have authority over those situations. And of course, Ephesians uh, 1.11, let's go back there to 11. It says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance that he may make everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first, and to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, which is all of us outside of the Israelite uh, nation, uh, you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. That's the foreknowledge. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give you, or give us, the inheritance He promised, and that He has purchased us by, with His own, us to be His own people. He did this so would we do what? Go to a different denomination, talk about how bad they are, those ones speak in tongues, those don't, those are immersed by baptism. No, He did it so that we would praise Him for His goodness for his redemption and his forgiveness and that would glorify him which is why the Bible says and Jesus gave an old command but a new command you shall love one another for by this they will know you're my disciples our authority again is rested on our relationship with God and Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and how we allow his power to be exercised in our lives by living for him and loving each other I know I'm not going to get through this whole message, but anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll end next week and then we'll get in. Anyways, how many of you would love to have the bank account of Bill Gates? None of you? I would love to try it out, see what that's like. Probably be boring after a while, but it would be kind of cool to give it a whirl, wouldn't you think? Okay, so if you were Bill Gates' child and he you know wasn't doing what some of the old the big old money makers are saying well I'm not gonna give it to this kid or that kid I'm gonna make them earn their own that's not our God our God doesn't withhold okay so if Bill Gates let's say didn't withhold you would have billions of dollars high position and there's nothing that you couldn't do in in the natural you couldn't stop death but you couldn't do in the natural you would have whatever you wanted monetarily if you want a house you just go buy it write a check if you want a new car no matter the cost you write a check and that would be your natural identity the Bible says that we have an inheritance from who can't hear you remember I got bad hearers through we have an inheritance from God do you think God just has got a little bit? He owns everything. And he's given us that inheritance. That means that as we walk in Christ, we have the fullness of heaven at our disposable. That's an awesome thing. And so Paul is reminding us about our inheritance. It's not based on what you've done or what you do. It's based on Christ. And because you believed on his son, you've received his inheritance. There's a, in Alpha Group, there's a, a picture of a guy who had a son. And his son painted a picture. Just like probably if I painted a picture. It probably wasn't that nice. But the son painted this picture. And this guy was... A Bill Gates and he had massive amounts of paintings that were invaluable Van Gogh's and all those other famous Rembrandt's and all those other guys and he died and his son died and they did an auction and so the lawyers did the auction and and uh, part of the auction was this they held up the son's painting that the father loved and they said, this is what we're to do. Who will put a bid on this painting? And all these billionaires and wealthy people, they looked at it and said, I'm not buying that. And the servant of the son says, I will buy it. How much will we give? 
I'll give you a dollar, I'll give you whatever they were asking. So he bought it. And the, the auctioneer snapped his gavel down on the thing and says the auction's over. Whoever buys the son's painting gets the rest of the estate. Hallelujah. We have bought the son. We who believe in Jesus have got the son and we receive the inheritance that the son has for ourselves. That's something to be excited about, church. That's the message of the gospel. And Paul is reminding us that we're adopted. And the Holy Spirit has been given as a seal of that adoption. What's the Holy Spirit do? He, well, he releases two things, assurance and authority. Assurance that you know that you're a child of God, not because of feelings, but because he said. And authority because you're in Christ. See, the enemy of our soul does not want us to believe, and he uses deception and doubt through false teaching and circumstances to break your understanding of authority. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, Paul begins to pray. I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Prayer is power. How many of you feel assured? Carla, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Wendy. Sorry, I forgot your name. But the point is, is oh, John, now you're going to make me label all your names, but no, that's not going to happen. But the point is, is the Holy Spirit has given us, been given to us by God, and it says that as a, a seal of a redemption, but he's been given to us that we may know that we're saved. He is our teacher. He's the one that leads us into all, all uh, truth and shows us things to come. I'm not going to go any further, but if you're wondering how you receive this revelation, it starts first by accepting the call of God. I'm sure that all of you that I see here have received Jesus Christ. So if you have received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, I'm going to put you on the spot. Raise your hand. Okay? If you haven't, just say, Jesus, I believe, and he'll come, if it's in your heart. Now, how many of you feel accepted by God? How many of you live like you're accepted by God? Okay, you know how you live by your accepted by God? You stop criticizing other people. You stop making people believe like you. And you begin to unify because of Christ. That means you exalt Christ, not your position. How many of you walk in that authority? It doesn't mean you'll get everything you ask for, but it means you have confidence that God hears your voice. In our prayer group, on Thursday, which is my uh, almost uh, my test model, I call it. We're learning about corporate unity and corporate prayer, and we're a perfect we're a perfect church for it because we really don't, in the natural, have a lot to offer. You know, we don't have a lot of numbers, we don't have big bands, we don't have a big stuff, but we have ourselves with Christ, which makes us a majority. But in the prayer group. To deal with our inheritance, it says in heaven, there's a reservoir. So that's our inheritance. But that reservoir can't come down into our lives and on earth unless we release it. And how do we release it? We begin to seek God. We begin to call upon his name. And the, the closer that we walk with God, the greater the pipes are in our lives that release the reservoir from heaven. And the experience of God's kingdom begins to flow out of our lives. The problem is, is we put corks in our relationship with God. We put it in how we view ourselves. We put it in by criticizing other people. We put it in by not forgiving. We put it in by not 
taking time each day, whether it's one verse or a chapter or a whole book, to read the scriptures and find our identity. God is calling us as God's family to stop looking out at the world and looking at the circumstance and begin to walk out our inheritance knowing that we're redeemed and forgiven in God, which means we release the same thing to other people. Prayer is about relationship. I end with this. As a pastor and as a Christian, I often wondered why I don't see a lot of times the Bible stuff in Acts and even the Old Testament working itself out. The miracles, the signs and wonders. By the way, those are secondary. And as I shared last week at, at our prayer group, when we look at the life of Jesus in John 5, it says that he did nothing that the Father didn't show him or speak to him. It says in other areas of, of the Gospels, it says that he went out daily and he took time, sometimes all night, with his Father. That's when he received the direction. And then he went out and he did what the Father showed him. And then in John 14 it says those same things that Jesus did, we can do in even greater things because there's more of us. But the problem I said to myself, why are we not sharing the gospel? Why are not we not releasing the resources materially for God's purposes? Why are we so divided as a church culture and picking apart one another? Why are we more interested in reaching out to other church people and bringing them in rather than reaching to a lost people and bringing them in? And it comes down to one thing, relationship. First, our relationship with God. So if we're always criticizing and, and running all over the place and not participating in God's kingdom purposes through the local church, it means our relationship with God is not built on prayer or intimacy with God. Because the things that we do in our lives, the power and the authority we exercise, are basically based on what we hear and see God speaking to us. And when we're not doing that, we're basing it on our techniques and our understanding, our own understanding. Basically, we're the dividers. Our money is released when we believe that it's for God's kingdom. Our proclamation comes when we know Jesus is our Lord and we're in love with Him. Our prayer is released because we know that God hears our voice. The question is, is will we allow the reservoir of heaven to flow through our lives? Jesus said in John 7, uh, 7 37, it says, Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And it says that He was talking about the Holy Spirit family of God, my call to us is to build unity, not conformity, doesn't mean we don't express our opinions and our differences, but to form unity based on Christ. If Victory Church of Penticton, but church in general in the West is going to survive, it's one of the fastest declining by the way, if it's going to survive, it needs to stop fighting. It needs to go back to the inheritance that we receive by being adopted by God. It means that everybody needs to participate, that everybody needs to proclaim, and everybody needs to walk in forgiveness. And then we will feel the unity, the authority, and the assurance that God has called us to do. And for you that are listening, or maybe someone here that's not feeling confident about the relationship with Jesus, Call on the name of Jesus and he will hear you and he will deliver you from your troubles. And then it's up to participating with him. Are you here and for God and moving for God? You know, one of the things, to just be real, is I'm not interested in having a group of people stay in the church that are not wanting to be a part of the family because all that does is sow dissension. doesn't mean I want any, uh, you to go, but at the end of the day, if you feel you're a part of another family, or this family uh, doesn't interest you, then I give you the freedom to go. So you won't hear that very often. 
But the point is, is we need to be a family, which means we need to build relationship with each other, first with God and then with each other, so that people can see that we love one another. We need to, which means we need to love one another with joy. And it needs, we need to participate with, participate with one another with joy. And it's not easy. How many of you come from a family where you fought with each other? <laughs> well, God's family is no different. We will fight. But the point is, is that's why he says we have to forgive. Because none of us are perfect. We're being made perfect. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your inheritance found in Jesus Christ. Lord, as we all s sit here in the church building, or in this building, to worship you as the church. Holy Spirit, you said that you want to come upon us and clothe us with power from on high, that we may be your witnesses. So I invite you, Holy Spirit, for everyone that's willing to allow you to clothe them with your presence. You're in them, now come upon them, that we may go forth from, with the power from on high to be witnesses wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Yep. How many of you have this? There we go. I've had these before, just so you know, the wafers are like wall. <laughs> Okay, so take out your little wafers on top. There we go. Now you got your wafer? Okay, it'll melt in your mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we were given a command by Jesus when he broke bread or when he was with his disciples before he went to the cross. And he says, do this always in remembrance of me. And it says, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he lifted it up with his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which will be given to you. He says, and take, eat, in remembrance of me. So we take this, this wafer and we digest it as the body of Christ. It doesn't become the body of Christ, but we take it in remembrance and in the body of Christ that he took our sin. He paid the price, the redemption, for us. So let's take and eat this as a unified family. And then it says, and this is all written in John 13, I'm just kind of going by memory here, but in John 13 and in 1 Corinthians 11, it says that Jesus took the cup in the same manner, and he says, this is a symbol of a new covenant and the forgiveness of sins in my blood. So as often as you eat this cup and drink, or eat this, or eat this cup, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will celebrate and remember the Lord's death. And so the cup of juice that we are, are taking as a representative of Jesus' blood is the price, but also the covenant. So when we take this, we're acknowledging that we are God's children and that we are part of God's kingdom, with Jesus being the head. So let's just take the, the juice and drink it together in remembrance of Jesus' shed blood. Just take a moment and thank God. Uh, you can do it quietly or outwardly for what he's done. Father in heaven, we thank you 
that you so loved us that you sent your only son. Jesus, we thank you that you willingly laid down your life for us, that your body took our sin upon it on the cross. The judgment of God came upon you for us. And that your blood was shed that we may have forgiveness and be received and accepted and adopted into your kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the body of believers. We thank you for your family. Help us, Lord, to begin to walk out your inheritance in our own life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that concludes our service. Um, if you have any questions, you feel free to call. Uh, have a good Sunday. Uh, again, AGM is on uh, Tuesday. We have also the fellowship lunch, which will be on May 29th at Carla's place. Is that right? Uh, so part of the things we want to build on is we want to build on fellowship and relationship. And uh, we do that with the lunch. And then if there's anyone that uh, can help out with uh, Nelson at the hospital, um, just let us know. And then what we'll do is we're going to connect you with Liz. Uh, his wife, and then she can set up some type of schedule of how that's going to look. Uh